The Book of Ruth, a story about a lady, Ruth, who seemingly has no special significance in terms of her genealogy or ancestry, and who also comes from a country that has a pretty bad reputation in the scriptures, a country called Moab. And this lady ends up becoming the bloodline, the great grandmother of King David, whose descendant, Messiah, the son of David, really has relevance for each and every person living in humanity today and for future generations. Uh, Messiah, as we learn in the wisdom of Kabbalah, is not a person, but rather a force. Messiah, Moshiach in Hebrew, comes from the word for pulling or Moshech in Hebrew, uh, which means a force that pulls us out of our inborn egoistic nature into the altruistic nature that exists outside of us in which we can feel a state of complete harmony, peace, eternity and wholeness. And that's the significance really of this story of where it begins and ends. We'll go through it in more detail as this show goes on. Uh, but other than that, we're also going to look at it from a Kabbalistic perspective. This is Kabbalah Explained Simply. I'm Marcus, by the way. And Kabbalistic perspective means that we're not going to look at this story as a some kind of historical account or even some kind of imaginary story, as if we can think of it as some novel, or some movie that we're watching with all these characters doing all sorts of actions and events happening to them in all kinds of places geographically. Uh, no, but rather in the wisdom of Kabbalah, we see all these stories as written in the language of branches, which means that each and every one of these names of people and of places and the connections between them and all kinds of motions happening between them, these are all things happening within the person, meaning within the person who's advancing, ad, sorry, advancing spiritually uh, from this world to the upper world, as we learn in the wisdom of Kabbalah, that the goal of the wisdom of Kabbalah is to reveal the spiritual world of altruistic forces that exist outside of the person to the person while they're living in this world and to elevate a person from their inborn egoistic perception where they perceive everything in a manner of what's beneficial for oneself alone to an inverted opposite perception where they perceive everything in terms of altruistic forces that connect between the person and all kinds of other people at the level of desires, at the level of forces, at the level of qualities, which we'll learn about more and more in this session, and which we learn about in the wisdom of Kabbalah in general. So that's how we're going to look at this story, the Book of Ruth. It's a rather unique perspective. You won't see this anywhere else other than in the authentic wisdom of Kabbalah. And that's about it. That's what we're going to get into in this episode of Kabbalah Explained Simply. So the Book of Ruth from a Kabbalistic perspective. We're going to get into it right after this. The Book of Ruth in Hebrew is Megillat Ruth, which literally translates to the Scroll of Ruth. We also have Megillat Esther. Uh, we know it as the Book of Esther or uh, you could say the Scroll of Esther. So there's this thing here with scrolls where the word for scroll in Hebrew, Megillah, connects to the same linguistic root as the word for revelation, which is Gilui. So what is being revealed here in these scrolls? Uh, and also there's another interesting aspect here that there are both females, both these female names, Book of Ruth, Book of Esther. What, what is this connection of some kind of revelation in relation to a female name? So just in short, the Book of Ruth is a revelation of the foundation of the soul's correction, which becomes known as the kingdom of the house of David, where David, again, we have the Messiah, son of David coming from that, which becomes the force that ends up being the uh, force that's capable of elevating and correcting the whole of humanity, which we learn about in the wisdom of Kabbalah. And the book of Esther represents the end of this process of the soul's correction. It represents the end of correction, the final state of correction, Gmar Tikkun. Uh, we read it usually at Purim, uh, whereas Book of Ruth is usually read at Shavuot for these reasons. All this stuff we'll get into a bit later, but that's just uh, some kind of aspect of why we look at these in relation to revelations and also why, what, 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 how does female fit into that picture? So female, uh, as we learn in the Wisdom of Kabbalah, represents a desire to receive that requires correction in order to bestow. And the male force represents the force that corrects the desire to receive with an intention to bestow. Correction in the wisdom of Kabbalah means 
applying an intention to bestow upon the inborn desire to receive. So this is how these two forces interplay. And all the female names and characters and male names and male characters all have those qualities in some kind of way. Even though in the Torah and those stories, there's a lot of intermingling between them. Uh, you can also look at it this way, where male represents the creator or the upper force of love and bestowal, which defines the creator in the wisdom of Kabbalah. There are many names for creator. You also see it uh, called Lord, uh, God. We also know it as nature as well, because we're talking about a force, a single force or a single quality of love and bestowal. Uh, Keter is the sphira that most represents that giving, you know, unconditional giving, unconditional loving force of uh, that's creating everything. And female, the opposite force of the force of creation or the created being. Uh, we also know it as the soul. In the sphirot, we know it as the sphere of Malchut. Malchut literally translates to kingdom. So when we're talking about the kingdom of the house of David, so we're also talking about that sphira of Malchut that uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Nukva as well is, is the literal translation of female in Hebrew. Uh, Nukva also connects to the same linguistic root as Nekev, which means a hole or a piercing, again, meaning a desire, this, this, this hole. Just like any one of our desires, we're talking about a, a certain lack, a certain uh, you know, wish or want for, for, for fulfillment. And the creator is the force that comes to, to fulfill that lack. And this is how these two forces interplay all throughout the spiritual structure. You can even see it in our own world, uh, at the, our own levels of desires. In short, the desire to receive pleasure uh, is called that, that female aspect and the desire to bestow is called that male aspect. And yeah, just before we get into it, so we're, we're talking about this, again, revelation of this full desire to... Uh, so we're talking about the revelation of the foundation of the soul's correction, uh, which is the kingdom of the house of David, which is what really comes out at the end of this book of Ruth. And that leads us all the way through to this book of Esther, which is the revelation of the end of correction of humanity. So you see here what kind of significance and just some more you know, general context before we actually dive into the story now. So let's get into the story. This is just a more of a summary of the story. We're not going to get into lots of the details. And we'll actually discuss why that is a bit later. But uh, let's get into it. Also under, with the full understanding that we're talking about now this inner process that we undergo and this, that we're not thinking about it in terms of you know, characters and places in history, but more as an inner spiritual process that we go through from our ascent from this world to the upper world. Because as we know, the goal of the wisdom of Kabbalah is to guide our uh, progress from this world to the revelation of the Creator to His creatures in this world, as as it's defined by uh, Kabbalist Yehuda Ashlag or uh, Bala Sulam. So we'll get into it. There was a famine in Bethlehem, which prompted Naomi and her husband Elimelech to migrate to the country of Moab, with their two sons Mahalon and Chilion. Elimelech died, followed by his sons, leaving Naomi, a widow with her Moabite daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. Yeah, so they obviously married uh, Mahlon and Chilion. So, in the beginning, what do we have? We have some famine in Bethlehem. And so this family that experiences this famine moves to Moab. So what we're talking about here in general, in terms of a spiritual process, is that we're in some kind of state where we were in some kind of spiritual connection. You know, we had that connection, we had that revelation of that force, or you could say quality of love and bestowal in our relations. And we felt that we some kind of new desire emerged. And in that new desire, we felt that there's no more nourishment of our spiritual desire anymore. That's what this famine in Bethlehem represents. Famine meaning no nourishment, no, no, no spiritual fuel anymore, no, no way to hold on to being in that state of having an intention to love and bestow upon and above our inborn egoistic desires. So what happens then? We move to Moab, meaning we undergo a spiritual descent. It's, it's the, it's talking about an inner state that's happening here in our spiritual progress. So just to fade out a little bit more, to put it at a more, you could say, beginner 
level. So in the wisdom of Kabbalah, we talk about us going through all kinds of development until we get to a point where we have a desire for spirituality before we even start a spiritual process that's being discussed here. So even before that, we go through a, a certain development of our corporeal desires. If you guys, by the way, are coming to these lessons all the time, so you probably hear this explanation all the time, but we'll try to give it in a bit of a zip just for anyone who's, who's new here. So we go through a development in our corporeal desires for food, sex, family, money, honor, control, and knowledge. Uh, this is a development that takes place over humanity's whole evolution, just as we can see from cavemen all the way through to uh, all the way through to today. You know, we went through periods where the whole of humanity even only had desires for food, sex, and family. It's called one level of desire, and then we developed through. Uh, desires for money, which is a certain level of exchange. We became more social and, and, and expanded beyond our individual level uh, through to desires for honor and control where everything developed more and more, where people started uh, working and wanting you know, respect, fame, and also power in society, and then further developed to knowledge where all kinds of sciences and philosophies, etc., developed. And at a certain point in our era, our era is represented by the, a new desire starting to emerge in humanity. We call that the desire for spirituality. The wisdom of Kabbalah calls that a point in the heart, meaning that the heart is the all of our desires to receive pleasure. And the point in the heart is the seed of the soul. A soul meaning a desire that enjoys not through receiving pleasure for personal benefit alone, which is our inborn nature, but a desire which enjoys through loving, bestowing, which is the spiritual quality, or you could say it's the quality of the creator, which we talked about before, the, the quality of the whole of nature uh, that's outside of the human. And there's a seed within us, this small point of a desire. It's not a fully worked and clarified desire, but something that connects to that force that's outside of us, which created us, which is in a constant mode of bestowal, and literally love towards us, even though we don't really understand or feel what that kind of love means. It's outside of our own definitions of love. So we get a small inkling for spirituality, and we don't know how to picture what it means to achieve that spiritual goal when we, when we feel it. We just feel all kinds of emptiness in the previous desires that we still mingle with, that we still go for out of necessity, meaning that we still have all kinds of desires for food, sex, family, money, on a control, knowledge, and we you know, go through them in our day-to-day -day workings. But there's some kind of extra dissatisfaction there. Uh, on a more general global level, we feel it, uh, it. It can be expressed as how there's all kinds of, you could say, more personal, mental, psychological problems on the rise, such as depression, loneliness, stress, anxiety. Uh, even uh, suicide rates and drug abuse rates uh, are a result of this new desire entering humanity more and more. But someone who becomes a spiritual seeker is one who's more actively searching for the answers to the questions of the meaning of life, to the purpose of life, who feels that everything is kind of meaningless, but also that feels that they're trying to piece the puzzles together and they, and they want some answers there to... So a person with this desire is the one who eventually comes and starts studying the wisdom of Kabbalah, which was made in ancient times specifically for answering that question about what is the meaning of life and to give these existential questions within us fulfillment, meaning to give that desire for spirituality, to give that point in the heart its fulfillment. What's its fulfillment? It, it defines its fulfillment as developing this point in the heart to a, to a point where we turn that point in the heart into an eternal and whole perfect soul and that we do so while we are alive in this world. Uh, Kabbalist Shehuda Ashlag or Bala Salam, he, de he defines the wisdom of Kabbalah as uh, a wisdom uh, that's no more and no less than a sequence of roots which hang down by way of cause and consequence by fixed determined rules interweaving to a single exalted goal described as the revelation of his godliness to his creatures in this world. Or you could say the revelation of the creator to us people while we are alive in this world. So with that understanding, we start undergoing this process of what's called spiritual attainment, or you could say spiritual discovery, uh, a process where we 
take this point in the heart with, that we've been given and we place it among certain means which translate to an environment. Uh, that environment also consists of what's called friends, a teacher, and texts, or you could say texts, Kabbalistic texts which describe to us that whole spiritual structure and how it comes down to our world. And through working in this environment, we attract those forces from outside of our inborn desires. We attract the forces from the spiritual worlds, from the spiritual reality. And those forces develop our point in the heart to a point where it, you know, to say it very uh, shortly, to say that, that it that it becomes a full soul and we, we attain the full eternal picture of reality there. We shift from this state of transience that we have in our current level of reality, as we know that all of our desires to receive, once we receive the pleasures that we try to go for, they're extinguished upon their reception. So we live in a transient reality. We know that we're, we got a death date at some point coming up. And so we shift beyond that and we attain an eternal uh, level of perception and sensation of reality, which relates to our soul, which relates to the full development of that point in the heart, which is a desire for bestowal when we attain its full revelation. And we also shift from a separated level of existence where right now in our inborn perception and sensation through our five senses so we see a whole reality around us which is full of me and all kinds of other people other things and this division between them the separation where i'm trying to use everything that i can for my own personal benefit and other things i don't pay attention to if i don't perceive them for my own self-serving purposes and also, it's a transition in terms of our pleasures, because all the pleasures that we go for in this world are all short-lived. The moment that the pleasure meets the desire, so that pleasure extinguishes in the desire. Whereas when we move into the spiritual reality and when we're perceiving through that point in the heart that we develop into its full uh, sensation and situation as a soul, so then we're uh, feeling pleasure also in an eternal way because we learn how to redirect pleasure so that it doesn't extinguish in the desire to receive pleasure which is our inborn desire but so that it's uh, in a mode of constant continuous bestowal so that spiritual state is the one where this story actually starts from where you have these characters who seemingly they come out of nowhere We'll talk a little bit about that as well. And they're in that spiritual state, but they're experiencing a famine in it. So while we're in this process of spiritual advancement, we go through many what's called ups and downs or ascents and descents. And it's not like the ups and downs of just mood in our world. What we're talking about is shifts between having that, having nourishment, having fulfillment in the spiritual level of desire, meaning that we enter that spiritual reality and we're vitalized there by certain forces that we're working with in that reality. And at a certain point, there's a new desire that comes along because one of the things we learn from, just like as we know in our corporeal reality, reality, as we talked about that process of evolution before from food, sex, family, through to money, through to uh, honor, control and knowledge to spirituality, there's a process of the desire always growing. So in our spiritual advancement, we also experience that growing desire. So, and we're always playing with these two opposite forces in reality. When we actually get some hook into the spiritual world, so then we are nourished by uh, bestowal, by love, by these qualities, and we uh, have a certain nourishment, a certain fulfillment there. And then the desire to receive, the egoistic desire is also growing all the time as well. And we're experiencing certain states where we go through some kind of dryness in that spiritual state where we're not feeling any fulfillment from it, sort of lack of nourishment. That's called famine in this story. And when we experience that, so we, we descend with these new desires that emerge. And that's also significant how these new desires emerge in the story. These characters uh, that we read about, uh, Naomi, Elimelech, Mal Malon and Chilion, and then later Orpah and Ruth, they, they appear just out of nowhere, out of some kind of darkness, out of nowhere. So it's like this new desire emerges, and it's like all these new characters. This whole story emerges with this new desire, you could say. And within that, we also experience this descent from, 
from that spiritual state that we no longer feel nourished in into this egoistic state which is known as Moab. Yes, yeah, so that's where we are now in terms of, uh, you could say, understanding this story from a, a spiritual perspective. Yeah, so these characters move, Elimelech, Naomi, Malon, and Hilion, uh, move down here, Elimelech, Malon, and Hilion, all the guys in the story, all the males, they all die. Again, male, as we learned about earlier, is the intention to bestow, it's the, that part which has a connection to, uh, to spirituality. So when we undergo this process of descent, so all the males die, or, or that whole intention to bestow is eliminated, and we're only left with the females. And we have then Naomi, and who's a widow now, and Orpa and Ruth, who are the, uh, also the widows of, of Mahlon and, and Chilion. So then, again, just to go through a few of these definitions to really process them in this spiritual understanding. So famine in the story, it means an in inability to nourish our spiritual desires to bestow. Moab, it's these worse, worse, and would you say the worst, toughest, and heaviest, heaviest desires to receive that cannot be corrected in order to bestow. That's where we descend to. Now, Elimelech, Mahlon, and Chilion, uh, it's a, it re represents that new egoistic de degree, thanks to which they can connect with those new low desires of Moab. So these are the, the, you could say, the males in the story that connect to the egoistic desires and then they die there. And Naomi is the general desire that comes from the side of unity, uh, since Naomi is Jewish, she's known as a Jew uh, in, in the story. Uh, we also learn, uh, Bala Salam writes in one of his articles, sorry, I can't remember where, but he writes how uh, Naomi it comes from the word Noam, uh, pleasantness. Uh, she's this uh, quality that connects always to, th there's a certain connection always to the spiritual uh, reality, and that's represented by Naomi here. So this process as well, uh, what we see here is th there's a saying that says, out of Zion, the Torah will go forth. So uh, Zion in uh, Hebrew, Tion, uh, comes also connects to the same linguistic root as the word for exits, which is Yetziot, Tion, Yetziot. So this also represents the, this process that we're always undergoing. And what we just learned about now, you could, you could talk about it also in relation to the more famous story about, uh, that we learn at Passover, for example, the, the descent of the Israelites into Egypt. Uh, so it's a similar kind of process. We're always going through this process in spiritual advancements of ascents and descents. And in general, that we have a certain connection with spirituality at some point, and then we lose that connection and head into a bigger, egoistic, worse desire. And it's all for the purpose of intermingling, incorporating with that egoistic desire, undergoing certain scrutinies in terms of what we need to do to rise to an even higher spiritual degree from there. That's really the thing here. And with the whole... You could say the whole of our spiritual work or the whole of the Torah, it's made of these processes of ascent and descent, and we'll see that in many, many stories. Naomi decided to return to Bethlehem, urging her daughters-in-law to stay in Moab and start anew, while Orpah reluctantly stayed. Ruth uttered her loyalty to Naomi. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Yeah, so we're in this situation where you have these uh, desires left after Elimelech, Mahlon, and Chilion all died, all the male parts died, and there were only the female properties. Out of these female properties, there comes a certain discernment where Naomi, which as we said, was the one who had that connection to spirituality. She's known as the Jew in the story. Again, Jew coming from the word uh, for unity. She's always got that connection to that... Uh, to that unity, that connection to that single force of, of love and bestowal, uh, which means having that spiritual connection. So Naomi says that she's going back to Bethlehem. So it means that there's a certain process of ascent where our desires that fell uh, into the worst egoistic desires, they undergo that scrutiny, those kind of corrupted uh, desires underwent a certain death there and new desires emerge, they go undergoing a scrutiny, and within these desires, we, we get one which says, you know, we can move up back into spirituality with this, with this desire, uh, which was there from before, meaning a small point undergoes a certain processing and comes out of it. 
And out of those two new desires that emerged, Orpa and Ruth, so or Orpa says, I'm staying in Moab, and Ruth says, I'm going with you. I'm just going to be, wherever you go, I'm going. Everyone who interprets this story also says about the loyalty that's involved in the story of Ruth to Naomi as being this quality that uh, is really the, the significant thing of this story. So that's what's happening here. So this is what you have here, this picture of, of the Naomi and Ruth going up, Orpah staying. Uh, you could also say how Orpah has the same letters in Hebrew as the word for Pharaoh, uh, meaning it's a quality that really represents the desire to receive, which stays there, stays uncorrected. And that's, uh, you could say, the role of the desire to receive, something that stays there. Uh, we'll move on. In Bethlehem, Ruth gleaned in the fields of Boaz, a relative of Naomi. Boaz noticed Ruth's diligence and showed kindness by letting her glean and providing extra grain. Naomi recognized Boaz as a potential kinsman redeemer, a relative who could marry Ruth and redeem the family inheritance. So what's this gleaning the field? And we also hear about fields many times. It's working on our desire for crops to emerge. We're working the fields, so we want certain crops to emerge, like bread and water. Uh, which nourish our desires that can undergo a correction in order to bestow. So we're always seeing this relationship to, to crops, to food, to growing, you know, food that can nourish us. Uh, if I just zoom out again on how we talk about it when we're studying the wisdom of Kabbalah and working on our spiritual advancement. So food in general is rooted in, in what's called the surrounding light. When we're studying the Kabbalistic texts, which talk to, talk to us about all the spiritual structures, the Sfirot, the worlds, the parts of Fim, as they concatenate down into this world. So we study them not for gaining intellectual knowledge, and also we don't study such stories as this. In general, we don't really even get into stories like this. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But we usually study the Kabbalistic texts uh, in the language of Kabbalah, Kabbalistic texts usually that come through us uh, uh, come to us through Kabbalist Yehuda Ashlag, Bala Sulam, who went to a lot of effort to create a lot of text, a lot of commentaries to uh, Kabbalistic texts such as the works of the Ari and the Zohar and expanded on it in the language of Kabbalah, which speaks to us directly about the spiritual structures and processes uh, in the upper worlds as they concatenate down into the our, our world. And that is really the whole study of the wisdom of Kabbalah, the Torah as well, and all these stories in the scriptures to talk about these same uh, areas that Bala Sulam and the Kabbalists write to us about. It's just written in a different language. Uh, in, uh, in, in the language of Kabbalah, it's, it's discussed a lot more directly, You're talking to direct spiritual structures and processes similar to uh, much more scientific than, than what we read in the Torah, which... Uh, can actually be very confusing how we see it as stories and, and we make of it all kinds of... Uh, we, we can easily get confused with uh, materializing what we read in these uh, stories from the scriptures like what we're doing now. But in the language of Kabbalah, so we talk about uh, specific structures and processes in the upper world. And what does it mean food here that I'm trying to get to? is that we, we study these texts, and in general we study the wisdom of Kabbalah. Everything that we, the whole purpose of studying Kabbalah, meaning sitting down with the Kabbalistic books and you know, around the Kabbalistic groups and with a Kabbalistic teacher, it's all in order to draw what's called the surrounding light. Light also represents the quality of the Creator as it comes down to our world. So we try to attract that quality to ourselves, uh, quality which represents, you know, those higher thoughts, a more spiritual state, a state of bestowal and love. We try to attract that to ourselves through the study. And through its attraction to ourselves while we study, we want that force to operate on us, on our desire within us. And it shows us on one hand, this elevation of importance and greatness of that spiritual reality, which we have no perception of, which is completely invisible invis to us in our five senses. We, we just don't have any access to it at all because our five senses 
uh, run by this motor of egoism, which constantly wants to receive any pleasure for self-serving purposes, for personal benefit alone. And spirituality is defined by a completely opposite mode of operation, a mode where we're in bestowal outwardly from ourselves, outwardly through others, meaning through those points in the hearts, through those desires of others, uh, to that full, complete, whole reality out there, which Kabbalists call the Creator, call nature, uh, where it's a quality of love and bestowal in its full completion. So that attracting of the surrounding light that we do in the study, that is, surrounding light in general has the same, it's known as food. Food is the branch level equivalent of the surrounding light. So that's, so surrounding light is the nourishment of our, of our spiritual desire. It's what we aim to get from seating ourselves and studying in Kabbalah lessons. Similar to how you put a phone into its charger each day in order for it to get fueled. That's more of a representation of why Kabbalists study regularly. Not in order to make a few more interesting intellectual connections for themselves, but rather to, to get that fuel, to get that charge, to get that nourishment from that spiritual level upon their spiritual desire, which allows for that spiritual advancement to take place, which allows for them to properly scrutinize and accelerate their spiritual progress. So gleaning the field in this process means working on our desire for these crops to emerge, meaning we want this bread and water, we want to attract the surrounding light to ourselves, we want that our desires are nourished, and that they undergo that correction from being in order to receive to in order to bestow. Uh, Naomi instructed Ruth on how to approach Boaz during the Harvest Festival, and Ruth followed her advice. Boaz, impressed by Ruth's virtue, agreed to act as a kinsman redeemer, but informed her that there was a closer relative with the first rite of redemption. In a public gathering, Boaz negotiated with the closer relative, who declined to redeem Ruth due to potential complications with his own inheritance. Boaz seized the opportunity and redeemed Ruth. He married her and restored Naomi's family inheritance. Ruth gave birth to Obed, the grandfather of King David. There's a lot here. Uh, who are all these characters here when we really get into it? Naomi, Boaz, even Ruth and all these. And how can we, in general, these characters, Obed, uh, before we get into discussing these connections and things, let's just talk about these names that we're seeing in the scriptures, in the Torah, lots and lots and lots of names. And in general, you see that there's many more names in the Torah and in the scriptures than we see, for example, in the language of Kabbalah. But we'll take it back to the language of Kabbalah for a second, which for, first and foremost, it discusses the Ten Sefirot. Uh, the Ten Sefirot as Keter, Chokhmah, Bina, Chesed, uh, Gvura, Tiferet, Netzachod, Yesod, Malchut. And we see names applied also by Kabbalists to these Firot, a few key names like Abraham representing Chesed, Isaac representing Gvura, Jacob representing Tiferet, Aaron representing Netzach, Moses representing Hod, Joseph Yesod. You got like upper Yesod, lower Yesod, you know, the upper one is, um, is uh, Solomon. Anyway, it's not too, not too important for now. Uh, and as we said before as well, you got David there representing Malchut. So King David, meaning that this uh, represents the, the full revelation of this Malchut in this in concatenation process. So these are some key names that we do also see in the language of Kabbalah. And in the Torah, we have all these names that we, we don't really see coming up so much in, in the language of Kabbalah, like Boaz and, uh, and Obed and, and, and all these kind of states. So you know, what are we talking about here? Uh, before we get to it, even before I get to opening that up a bit. So, yeah, as we said, we have a, a few real fundamental ones, like you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, representing full Sfirot, and usually in the language of Kabbalah, we're talking about these kinds of structures. And in the Torah, we get into all these, you could say, you could say sub-names. It's because, you know, the Ten Sfirot, it's a very highly integrated structure with a lot of mingling and mixing, Kind of like if you think about a salad undergoing a processing, which you know, which gets cut up and cut up and cut up, and therefore you have lots and lots and lots of substates, like uh, you know, this upper part of this sphera connecting to the lower part of that sphera, with a little bit of a mingling and a mixing of another sphera, and that's a specific state that's there in a specific part 
of our spiritual advancement. And that specific thing, if you really would write down every combination and mingling of this integration that's happening within that specific mingling of Sfirot and parts of him, you'd have some kind of explanation which is half a page long, which you have some examples like that, for example, in chemistry in this world, you have such you know, huge names where it just writes out everything that's going on there. So Kabbalists don't, don't go to that level of detail, but in the Torah, that's actually what these names are describing. So when, that's why when you come to a name like Boaz to describe the exact, uh, the exact place in the Sfirot, you, you don't really see that described because it's such a complicated, uh, it's such a complicated mingling and how it comes about from other minglings that the Torah ca comes and gives it the, these stories, this wrapping the way we know it. Uh, whereas the wisdom of Kabbalah uh, describes, you, you could say, more general structures and, uh, and, and minglings and have things happening there. So in general, we'll, we'll say a few things about these words, just with that understanding that Boaz, for instance, acts as the creator toward Ruth, the creation. Yeah, there's a, as we, we didn't read it in the summary uh, that I just read, but there's a whole thing about Ruth constantly going and, you know, uh, you know, treating Boaz, you know, working for him, being at his feet, really expressing complete loyalty to, to Boaz. So R Ruth's work there is that, you know, she's part of this desire to receive that joins the desire to bestow. It's, it's a, it's a expressing, I will just read this full one and, and can become sanctified, meaning that it can receive with a screen and reflected light. Uh, Ruth also, uh, Bala Salam explains to us in, in that same article I mentioned before, which I'm sorry, I, I lost the name of, but it, Let's put it this way, I'll put it in the description later, so you'll see that article linked in the description. But Ruth comes from the word for worthy, reuya, mean, uh, raui in, in Hebrew means worthy, so uh, that's where the word Ruth comes from. So when the desire to receive really clings on to the upper level, really annuls itself and, and takes everything it can from the other level, serving that upper level uh, to the best that it possibly can, expressing its adhesion to the upper level, where the upper level here, before it was represented as Nomi, which led Ruth you know, from Moab to Bethlehem. And in Bethlehem, it's represented as Boaz, the male quality that emerges from that same, as it says, he's a kinsman redeemer. He's uh, from that same family line as Nomi, meaning that uh, he's also a, a Jew representing one who uh, is in this unity, one who represents that spiritual unity. And so Ruth, through her clinging on to that uh, that, that higher spiritual quality, or you could say our desire to receive, that, that clings onto, that joins, that adheres to the desire to bestow. So that's what allows our desire to undergo this process of correction from our adhering to, let's just put it more into our terms of how we study in the wisdom of Kabbalah. So, you know, if I have that point in the heart and I'm studying the wisdom of Kabbalah, I learn about these means that we can plant this point in the heart into, as we said, the, the friends, which represent others who share a point in the heart, others who share that same spiritual goal, who are willing to support and encourage uh, working on, uh, on ourselves in order to attain that spiritual goal. So we, we put ourselves into that environment, which is called the friends, uh, the uh, friend also in Hebrew, the, the word for friend is chaver, which comes from the word for connection, chibur. So it's others who share that same spiritual desire with the same spiritual goal, it meaning others who share uh, the, we share the same ability to connect to each other, to connect to that common point. I mean, everyone's willing to work in a mode of trying to exercise that, that quality of love and bestowal in order to attain that in, in their connection. And that allows everyone, it gives everyone fuel as we said we need that fuel we need that nourishment in order to in order for our desire to undergo a certain processing uh, to connect with those other desires in that mode of bestowal which is a um, spiritual action uh, that that connection means attaining that intention to bestow as we just read in the definition of ruth it's the uh, sanctification of our desire to bestow what's in the wisdom of kabbalah called receiving with a screen and reflected light. We'll show that a little bit later on. But friends is one aspect. Books is another aspect. Books is uh, texts written by Kabbalists, meaning people who have received Kabbalah reception, meaning people who have received that 
spiritual attainment of the upper reality of those higher worlds and who write to us from that attainment in order for us to use those texts primarily to draw the surrounding light to to, to uh, have our desire come into contact with those upper forces to get nourished from those upper forces and to be able to use those forces in order to uh, essentially reach the same state as those forces to uh, invert our desire into one that is in a mode of love and bestowal which is a spiritual state which is a state which is equal to the creator which uh, w pleases the creator we say uh, and so the the teacher the friends and uh, sorry the books the friends and the teacher as well so the teacher is the one who is a an attained kabbalist and who has the ability to guide us on how to use the friends or the group and how to use the books and uh, to to guide us through so we don't get you know uh, deviated along the way it's very easy to get deviated when we're dealing with uh, an egoistic quality within us that constantly wishes to please itself which is opposite of spirituality so the process here is working with these means all the time in order to draw the surrounding light and that's similar to what we just see with Ruth here that it's a uh, this quality that just clings onto this upper level uh, in order to draw the forces from it you know first it's expressed as her loyalty to Naomi next it's uh, expressed as her loyalty to Boaz and then uh, the you know undergoes all certain states there until she eventually marries Boaz, meaning it's that merger, it's with the state when it receives with the screen and reflected light. This is essentially re expressing what spiritual attainment is, meaning that we have a desire to receive, which is just our inborn nature. When we receive with a screen, screen in Hebrew is masach, uh, so the direct light doesn't, the direct light meaning this, this pleasure that extends from the Creator toward us, instead of it coming in and extinguishing in the desire which represents our corporeal reality yeah so if we took away this screen we'd have a situation where that arrow would be going in here and just extinguishing that's that's what our corporeal reality today is defined as as we know that for example at the most basic level of an example if you're hungry so you have a desire that so this desire here appears through that hunger and then this arrow comes in, uh, meaning that we, we eat what we want to eat. And that makes, the that makes the desire get extinguished. We no longer have that desire anymore. And then we get a new desire and a new desire. And that's, the, that's how our egoistic desire works, our, our, our desire to receive. But here it's showing the opposite. It's showing that the direct light, that pleasure extending from the Creator, we develop this ability to re resist it and reflect it. Uh, meaning we attain some ability to to bestow as the creator bestows upon us and that's already attaining a spiritual state that's a, that's describing a state of spiritual attainment that's what ruth eventually becomes just from her uh you know we we know about it in the sto story is loyalty uh you could say it's a it's annulment this this process of just willing to uh, cling on to that higher level so and get nourished from it until it becomes worthy of bestowing just like the higher level that it's clinging to so that's that's essentially what we go through in this process and as we know ruth becomes the great grandmother of king david as a result of this uh, it's the expression of the spiritual quality of malchut kingdom as we see here in the these are the uh, really, these are the Sefirot, you can also describe them as uh, four Bchinot, you know, so Keter, Chokhmah, Bina, Ziranpin, which represents the six Sefirot of Chagat Nehi, Hesed Gvura Tiferet, Netzachod Yesod, that's all contained in Ziranpin, and then Malchut, so that's what comes about through this whole uh, process. Uh, we get this expression of the spiritual quality of Malchut, which is King David, and then his descendant is Messiah, the son of David, uh, or Mashiach ben David, uh, which is essentially the force that will correct humanity through its elevation from the egoistic desire to receive to the desire to bestow. And as we said, Messiah or Mashiach uh, comes from the word for pulling, Moshech. So meaning that the Messiah is not a person as as many you could say think it is, but uh, in, according to Kabbalists, Messiah is specifically that force that we're talking about. As we say, we're, we're, we're trying to attract a force that's surrounding light in order to, for that light to make changes in us, in order for our intention to change from being for myself, 
self-serving personal benefit, one that extinguishes within this desire that's within me, this lack, this hole, as we said, uh, nekev for hole. So inverting the direction that our desire is operating from that, the intention upon the desire, from egoistic going inside of me to more or less altruistic, inverted outwardly with an intention to bestow and love uh, to others, to other people, not essentially to people, but to their desires and through their desires, their spiritual desires to bestow to the creator, to attain that intention to love and bestow upon our uh, innate, inborn desire to receive. And we do that through drawing that force which pulls us out of it. So that's that's why as well, when, when Ruth is doing this clinging to Naomi, to Boaz, she's essentially, it's representing the creation, the created being, clinging to the creator to such a point where the creator eventually sees that the creation is worthy of being granted the creator's quality. And then the creator grants the creation that quality, meaning that the creation acquires that screen and reflected light, the ability to bestow upon the desire to receive, that is the innate nature of the created being. So that's really the whole significance of this uh, story of Ruth or the book of Ruth, Mekilat Ruth. Something else we can just quickly say about it as well is, we, we said a little bit about it at the beginning, but just to emphasize it, that all these characters, as we said, they all just emerge at the beginning of the story, Elimelech, Marlon, Kichilion, Naomi, all these characters, they just emerge, as we said, it was this emergence of this new desire, so we don't hear about them before this story starts. It's, it's as if from an, some kind of unknown darkness, this new state emerges, and all of a sudden this whole appearance of all these characters, all these, uh, all these people in the story that we know of emerge. So that also is connected to the fact that, uh, as we see in this story, another example is how you have a person who has no, no special genealogy, no special ancestry. Uh, Ruth, for instance, she's a Moabite. You know, she married into some desire that descent, descended from spirituality into, uh, in, into egoism and died there. And through emerging due to that situation, she eventually clings to Naomi. And through her work, meaning that it doesn't matter what we can take from this is that it doesn't matter what a person's ancestry is, uh, you know, what kind of genealogy they have, you know, everything in, in spirituality, all that doesn't matter. You know, what uh, all, all these corporeal situations that a person's part of, if that spiritual spark emerges in them, if that point in the heart emerges in us and we process that point in the heart correctly, meaning it's all up to the person and their per that person's work, how that person utilizes their free choice in this world. So that can bring us into spirituality. And as you see here, Ruth, as we said, coming from some kind of no place, you know, Moab, without any special connection to any families or anything, just from that person's work ends up becoming the great grandmother of King David, which ends up having significance for the whole of humanity's correction afterwards, right? So that's another thing here that it's also why we say that uh, spirituality, you know, it's open for everyone, regardless of age, race, you know, background, any kind of religions or any, any kind of views anyone finds themselves in. It's all outside that because it relates to this higher level of desire, which is beyond our world that emerges. And, it is, and if a person finds himself asking about the meaning of life, the purpose of existence, all kinds of existential questions emerging within them. So that's sufficient enough for that person to be able to take all the steps necessary in order to move from this world into the spiritual world and, and to attain spirituality, just like anyone. And really, there's this equal ability given to everyone, according to the level of desire to move into spirituality. One of the things we say in the wisdom of Kabbalah is that there is no coercion in spirituality, you cannot force spirituality upon a person. So that's also a very significant thing that comes from this story that really, it's all up to a person the desire that's in them, the work that they do with that desire in order to attain spirituality. And there's nothing within a person's background that connects into, you know, whether that person can become worthy. As we said, that Ruth comes from that word for worthy, Reuia. Uh, so that's it. So also with that, we'll go out and 
uh, you can, if you do want to process a spiritual desire that might be burning inside you uh, to get more, uh, more information, more structured information, if you want to also take structured courses that lead to uh, higher levels of study, that's all at CABU. You know, there's lots of courses there you can take on all kinds of things that might interest you in relation to spirituality and also the wisdom of Kabbalah. And there's also a structured learning path that can lead you to eventually, if you wish, uh, study with a uh, study group and, and move ahead with them. So that's all at CABU. Also, we'll be holding a live Q&A session. We hold a live Q&A session on Zoom in CABU after this Kabbalah Explained Simply session each Sunday. So if you go to CABU and sign up there, you'll also be able to join that. So that's it. That's all we have time for today. I'm uh, happy to be with you. This is Marcus in Kabbalah Explained Simply and look forward to seeing you next time. See you later. David's kingdom was dependent upon the illumination of the Mochin of Midnight. This is why he rose at that time and sang. Midnight is the darkness in its full intensity, and David is the point in the heart that awakens inside me, which awakens at midnight in the dark and wants to thank for the darkness which came where from the darkness it can resurrect and against that darkness to resist the darkness and turn it into light. There's no day or night in what I feel, but I turn the night, the darkness, my egoistic unsatisfaction, I turn it into light because as much darkness as I have inside, it means it is a sign that I feel the gap between me and the light, the difference. That's the, the darkness, the light, the gap, the difference between what I am in my quality and the quality of the Creator bestow that's outside of me. And it turns out that if now I change myself from reception to bestow, then instead of this gap, I'll feel equivalence of form. Instead of darkness, I'll feel light.